Well, we're going to read this evening from the book of the prophet Zechariah. And I guess when I say that, some of you already are wondering, where is that? Just to say it's very easy to find. If you find Matthew's gospel, and then just go back a few chapters into the Old Testament, and very rapidly you'll come across Zechariah. It's the second to last book in the Old Testament. Just going to read a few verses from uh, chapter 3 of Zechariah. So Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 1 to verse 5, which is a very dramatic incident. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. And he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich garments on you. Then I said, Put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him, while the angel of the Lord stood by. Amen. Well, this is a communion service, and what unites us here this evening is not that somehow we are good people, or that somehow we are religious people, or people of faith, or something like that. But the one thing that unites us here this evening is that we meet together as men and women and boys and girls who are absolutely convinced that we are sinners in need of the grace and the mercy of God. The account which we've just read, which we're going to consider just for a very short time this evening before we pray and we have the Lord's Supper together, is an account of a man conscious of his sinfulness and his uncleanness, but who is made clean. And so as we gather here tonight, we, we don't come with a sense of morbid despair over our sins, though it is right to grieve over our sinfulness. We come nevertheless as a people who are also joyful because we know that in the gospel of Jesus Christ there is forgiveness for all of our sins. The Bible speaks about this so many times. It is ultimately the dominant theme, it seems, of many of the great movements in the Old Testament. And here as God speaks to Judah at a time of great difficulty and crisis for them, central to what he says is ultimately the hope of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What I read to you from chapter 3 tonight is the third of eight visions that Zechariah is given in this book book. Some of the visions are rather strange for us to understand. In fact, if we went on to read further in this chapter this evening, we would have come to verse 9 and where we would have the word, see the stone I have set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that one stone. Have you ever seen a stone with eyes? The reason this sounds strange to us is that the particular way in which Zechariah is written is a style which crops up in the Bible from place to place. We know it as apocalyptic. It is a style almost like parables, not to be taken literally, but showing us truths that are absolutely true about God and his intention for his people, particularly in a time of adversity and crisis. Well, this is the third of those eight visions, and it began in verse 1 of chapter 3 with the word then. And in fact, when we look at all these visions, we find that all the visions begin with the word then. In other words, all the visions are a response to something God is doing and saying. They are a consequence, in other words. That's when we use the word then, isn't it? 
I pushed him, then he fell over. Or I pushed him, then I went to the headmaster, as it used to be with me, or something like that. It's a, it's a word that speaks of consequence. And so these visions are a consequence to what God has already been saying in the opening verses of chapter 1. These words, given through the prophet Zechariah, we ought to say there are 30 Zechariahs in the Old Testament. It's a rather common name. But this was a particular man raised up by God. We're told in verse 1 of chapter 1 that he was the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido. Or we might say Idho in Wales with the double D there. That immediately connects us with the ministry and the life that what we see in Nehemiah. A man who also God raised up, who wasn't a priest or a prophet, but he was a leader and he was raised up by God to enable and to support and to lead God's people in the rebuilding or the start of the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem after many years of exile in Babylon for Judah. In fact, we're told in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 1, that these words, these visions from God, they took place during the eighth month of the second year of Darius. And interestingly, historians tell us that was October the 27th in the year 520 BC. It's a very precise moment, in other words. And it's the reminder in itself that God is speaking into the history of his people. Something precise is happening here. They've returned from exile, but they are a rather ragtag outfit. The work of rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem has begun, but it is not complete. And it is a time of uncertainty. And fresh in their memory, is the memory of the reason why they were in exile in Babylon, which was, of course, because of their sinfulness. Verse 2 of chapter 1, The Lord was very angry with your forefathers. And part of the judgment of God was the Babylonian exile. But now they're coming back. But it is an uncertain time. How are they to face the future? What are they to do? And more importantly, what is to say that they will not commit the same sins of their forefathers and once again fall under the judgment of God? And so it is really wonderful in chapter 1, verse 1, that we read that during the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah. This is a moment of reassurance from heaven. Here is God stabilizing the nation in its uncertainty. He raises up this character, Zechariah, whose name interestingly means Yahweh or, or Jehovah remembers. God remembers. But the question is, what is he going to remember? Is he going to remember their rebellion, their sinfulness? Or will he remember his covenant promises? With his people. And it is very, very clear early on in chapter 1 that God speaks hope to Judah through Zechariah. The remembering is the remembrance not of judgment but of faithfulness. Listen to these words from chapter 1. This is what the Lord Almighty says Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you. It's the language of covenant. You return to me, I will return to you. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Do not be like your forefathers to whom the earlier prophets proclaimed. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Turn from your evil ways and your evil practices. But they would not listen or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. So the great thing that God is asking Judah to do through the words of the prophet Zechariah is to listen and to heed the words of God. And friends, that has not changed since that time when these words were first uttered. 
When God speaks, we need to listen. And more than that, we need to pay attention to him. But within all of this, the heart of God is seen. He is pursuing his people. He is restoring his people. And as it ever is with God, when he restores us in our spiritual rebellion, it is never a sudden thunderclap and everything is okay. But there is the slow, steady rebuilding. It's true, isn't it, that when we go into a period maybe of backsliding as Christians or we get into life, gets into chaos, we kind of want someone to say, well, come up on the stage and behind the magic curtains and we'll do this and you come out the other side, everything will be wonderful. One of the other prophets writing at a similar time as Zechariah speaks about God healing our backslidings. He says it's like the dew of the morning appearing. It's not a sudden deluge and a thunderstorm, but it's this sudden, certain, gradual dampening of the ground with the dew. And it's like that when God deals with us, when we have wandered away with, from him. Often there is this slow, steady rebuilding. Probably one of the most lovely and dramatic examples of this is in the New Testament, after Peter has denied our Lord three times. And then it is with three questions and three opportunities for affirmation that Jesus rebuilds this man. Now, when we come to our vision, and I say there are eight visions here, but we come to the vision which I read to you from chapter 3. The focus here is very much on dealing with the issue of our awareness of guilt and shame over sin. And I wonder tonight, as we gather here to break bread and drink wine together in the memory of our Lord, whether you've been troubled, troubled today, or maybe this week, with a great sense of guilt and shame over sin. It's interesting, isn't it, in the Christian life that sometimes things that we did many, many years ago can be suddenly brought to our memory. They can trouble us. We could find ourselves with a great feeling of unworthiness and sometimes great shame. Well, in the vision, the focus is on a high priest called Joshua. It seems that Joshua functions here as a representative of the people. As in reality, it is not just Joshua being addressed, but all of God's people. As high priest, he is the holy man. The one under the law of God, chosen and separated by God for holy duties uniquely. He is the one ultimately who is set apart to stand between men and God in the function of sacrifice. But now he stands before the angel of the Lord and Satan. In verse 1 of our chapter, which we read, the vision speaks about how he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The vision is of a courtroom. The language that's used here suggests a legal process is enacted here. Satan standing at his right side to accuse him has a legal resonance in the day and age that this was written. And Satan is there to accuse, to bring to the memory to point the finger, to expose and bring to the light and the surface the sin of Joshua and by implication the sin of Judah. But the angel of the Lord is there as well. Generally speaking in the Old Testament when we read of the angel of the Lord we would understand that to be a reference to the Son of God prior to his birth in Bethlehem coming to us. So people might ask the question, where is the Son of God? Where is Christ in the Old Testament? Well, he's, he's all over the place, to be honest. But one of the clearest places, most obvious, is in that reference to the angel of the Lord. And yet at the same time, the New Testament tells us 
But Christ, who is our saviour and our deliverer, is also the one in Romans 14 before whom we must give an account. So there's the law court. Satan the accuser, the prosecution, and the judge is the ultimate judge of all, the angel of the Lord, who is the Son of God. I don't know if you've ever been to court. Um, I, 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 I like courtroom dramas, I must be honest. Whether it's a John Grisham novel or something like that, or uh, Perry Mason <laughs> back in the day. I love those dramas. They're, they're, great but I remember some years ago going to visit the museum in Brecon you haven't been there it's worth going to because within that museum they had rebuilt or the in, inner workings of the old court which the county court and you can go and stand in the dock it's a pretty dreadful place intimidating with all the finery the craftsmanship of the wood and everything but the awareness that in that moment when you stand there, all the attention is on you to expose, to analyze, to pick over motives, actions and words and whatever. That's the picture that we have here. And the problem is Joshua really is guilty. So it's not a whodunit, it's not a man wrongfully accused, it's not a, one of those courtroom dramas where the great energy is put in by the new up-and-coming defence lawyer to get the obviously innocent fellow uh, proven guilty before the, uh, before the jury. It's not like that at all. Joshua is really guilty. And he is guilty in the same sense that we are all guilty before God. It's illustrated in verse 3. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. And the word that's used there in Hebrew is the word for excrement. So you get the idea. We're not just talking about somebody who's got a little bit of dirt on him. He is covered in the most odious filth you can imagine. And this is deeply shocking because he is the high priest. This makes him ceremonially unclean before God in the law. It also would have made him a, a wholly offensive spectacle. Not only to the eye, but to the nose as well. Now in reality, friends, this is something that every Christian identifies with. And we come to that point of acknowledging what is at the heart of the gospel. It is good news, but it is good news for filthy sinners. If our understanding of the gospel tonight is that this is merely something to give us a leg up in life, to, to sort us out from some social problem or some difficulty or weakness that we may feel we have emotionally or psychologically, we've not understood the gospel. The gospel addresses the fact that we stand before the one before whom we must give an account in filthy clothes. And we hear the accusations of Satan. And Satan's accusations, the implication in this vision is, are not lies, though he is the father of lies. He doesn't need to lie. All he does is bring to the light the reality of that we're sinful. But in the middle of all of this stands Joshua the high priest. Now we don't really know anything about Joshua the high priest. This isn't the Joshua of Joshua and Moses. That was many years previously. And it seems that in the vision that is given to Zechariah, the naming of the high priest is crucial. For just as Zechariah is a name that speaks about Jehovah remembers, God remembers, the name Joshua means Jehovah saves. There is hope in the courtroom. And that hope is seen immediately because before Joshua is called to speak in his own defense, the judge, the angel of the Lord, speaks for him. Verse 2, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, not Joshua. Though Joshua is dressed in filthy clothes before the holiness of God, but it is Satan who is rebuked. 
And more than that, the Lord identifies himself now as the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem. Jerusalem that is still in ruins because of their sinful rebellion. He chooses to identify with Jerusalem and again he speaks to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. It's not you're wrong. It is much stronger than that. It is a rebuke. For accusations and the exposure of sinfulness ultimately has no place in this courtroom. For something has happened here. The second part of verse 2. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? You may have heard the phrase, a brand snatched from the fire. It's the, it's the same thing. It's speaking of Joshua, the high priest now. This guy covered in all this mess and in totally inappropriate and about as condemned as condemned can be, about as looking as guilty as a man can be. But the Lord's assessment of him is that though he was a burning stick one day in the fire, he has been snatched from the fire. Something has happened to rescue him and to deliver him. And so in that courtroom, the accusation of sin is shouted down. Satan, the accuser, is rebuked. And Joshua is justified. He is not under judgment. He has been delivered from judgment. He has been snatched from the fire. This is the declaration of the great judge of the heavenly court on Joshua. And friends, we gather here tonight to give thanks to Almighty God that in His mercy and in His grace, this vision which is before us is a picture of our own lives and our own experience as His people. The Christian knows what it is to stand condemned in the presence of Almighty God. Probably here tonight you know something of what it feels like to to appear in filthy clothes before the holiness of God. Apparently without a hope in the world. And then through the grace of God, the overwhelming love of God, the unstoppable compassion and mercies of God that are new every day, he speaks, <coughs> rebuke not to you but to your accuser. Because something has happened, something has been done to snatch you from the fire. And of course that something is Jesus Christ, the one who is the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, once took on flesh and became a baby. They laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. The same one. And he lived amongst us. He was known as a man of sorrows, familiar with grief. But he was faithful and obedient to the will of the Father and the requirements of the law. And one day he died for you on the cross. That your guilt, your filthy clothes, your sin might be wonderfully, permanently, and gloriously dealt with. In verses 4 and 5, the next thing we see is a declaration from the angel to Joshua. Take off his filthy clothes. See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich garments on you. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. It's a wonderful picture, isn't it? Of the grace of God and all that Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. Paul, writing in his letter to the Romans, speaks about the Christian being clothed in the robes of Christ's own 
righteousness. Here is clothing in Christ that can satisfy the holiness of Almighty God. He alone can present us faultless and perfect before the great majesty of eternal God. Well, I trust this encourages us tonight if we've come here with a sense of shame or guilt an awareness of our own sin it's quite probable as a christian that that awareness is as a result of the accusations of satan seeking to discourage you and to bring you down but we must turn our ears tonight to the words of the lord jesus christ who as the angel of the lord speaking to joshua speaks to you as well Take off his filthy clothes. I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich garments on you. Zechariah's name meant God remembers, and Joshua's name is God saves. And that's our hope, isn't it, tonight? And I trust it's our comfort as well. That as conflicted as we may feel inside, conscious of our sin and our shame, we have a saviour and we are here this evening to remember him together. Let's spend some moments in, in quiet and in prayer. Just a few moments as we reflect on what we've heard. And after a few minutes, Jimmy will start to play our, our next hymn, which is Lord in the Stillness now. But we'll have a little time of quiet first and then Jimmy will start.